Thank you, Claire. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for your nice words. It is really an honor to be introduced by somebody like Claire Martin that represents Disney. And as she said, Disney has been one of our main supporters. And we have done fantastic things for the Penguins. So before we start, I want you to introduce my assistant. In case you want to know, he's Charlie. And I'm going to leave the assistant here, and his job is to pay attention, so you all pay attention to my talk. Hmm? So in this presentation, at the beginning, I want to tell you how I started, why I, I started working with penguins, and uh, what motivated me, what inspired me to dedicate my life in penguin conservation. And then I'm going to tell you different things about the penguins, the, the problems they are facing, their current conservation status. We're going to dive a little bit into the penguin world to see how many penguins there are in the planet, their habitats. And finally, we are going to, I'm going to tell you about the different threats that the penguins are facing and what are we doing specifically from the Global Penguin Society to help penguins tackle those issues. So I have a strong emotional connection with the penguins. And I dedicated most of my life to them. And I never thought I was going to spend all my life with them. And I think I work on penguin conservation and penguin research thanks to my grandmother. My grandmother, she married my Greek grandfather, and they both went to live to the southern part of Argentina in a place called Patagonia, in the Atlantic side of Argentina. And she used to go with horses, as you can see in the picture, and wagons to the coasts of Patagonia 100 years ago. And when I was a small kid, she used to tell me those amazing and fantastic stories about her visits to the penguins. And I think that those messages and those stories left like a very strong and powerful message inside of me. And finally, when I visited a penguin colony, for the first time, I can tell you that I felt that strong connection, and I knew that I was going to dedicate my life for their conservation. In those years, which were the late 80s, 80, uh, 40,000 penguins died per year in this province of Argentina only due to oil spills. So I was at the beginning of the university. I quit university with some friends. I don't recommend that to my sons now. So we went and we established a rehabilitation center in one of the most, uh, one of the largest Magellanic penguin colonies in the planet, Punta Tombo. And that was very important for me because when I watched with my friends and we, with our colleagues the first penguins and we released them, I could see that the difference that we could make with an action like that. So I did decided that I wanted to work in conservation, but I went into the university, I became a, a PhD, to be better prepared to help them better. And I always like to tell that I owe penguins a lot, because I even met my wife thanks to the penguins. And this is really a good story, because I met her in some of these islands, in, in Chubut, Argentina, I was sent, that this was the early 90s, I was sent to a remote island to count penguins. We were supposed to look for penguin colonies and count them. And I met my wife there. She's a, a marine mammal biologist. But I met her because she was doing her PhD. And in fact, she was collecting the head of dead sea lions. So she was literally cutting the head of the Dead Sea Lions, and she was, you know, walking on the beach with the Dead Sea Lions. <laughs> so believe me, that was not the most romantic moment of our lives. But anyway, we got married, and we got our, own, our two fantastic sons, Germán and Alejo. But this picture was a long time ago. Now Germán is 21 years old. He's studying economy. And Alejo, to your right, he's studying mechanical engineering. But I'm sure they're not biologists, but we made sure they're going to have a strong role in conservation. So I want to show you why penguins are not only important to me and why they should be important to all of us. Because penguins are excellent sentinels and fantastic indicators of the health of our oceans. 
penguins, somehow they are warning us in their own language that the oceans are in trouble. So the oceans are in trouble, and so are the penguins. Out of the 18 species of penguins that exist in our planet, 55% are listed as endangered or threatened. So five of them, five species, are considered endangered. Other five species are listed as vulnerable. Three are considered as near uh, threatened. And the last five are considered least concerned. So let's meet the penguins. You know, most of the people, many, maybe due to cartoons or some movies, most of the people think that there are only four or five penguins and they all love eyes, you know? But the truth, is, the truth is that most of them, they don't like cold temperatures. They don't like to live on ice. But they, they, out of the 18 species, uh, they live in a wide variety of habitats. Some of them, like the emperor penguin, which is like Happy Feet, for example, or the March of the Penguins, they live in these fantastic places in Antarctica where they don't have any nesting material, just ice. Some of the penguins, they live in desertic areas, like this humble penguin in Peru that is hugging his friend, this cactus. Some others, they live in, in uh, lava caves, mm, like this Galapagos penguin in, of course, Galapagos Island. And this is the rarest penguin species of all. The global population of these ones is only 1,500 pairs, and that's all. And some other penguins, and some of you, I guess you didn't know, they live in the, in the forest, like the penguins that live in New Zealand, for example. This is the Fjordland crested penguin. Do you see the penguins in the picture? You find it over here? It's very difficult to find them because they nest in, in, the, in nest under logs and under trees and on very steep slopes. So it's very difficult for us to look for them and to work for them. The population of these guys is only 3,000 pairs now. In the last 30 years, 14 species of penguins have been reclassified to a more severe conservation status. And this is because penguins face threats, not only when they are in the ocean, but also when they come on land and they spend some months nesting and taking care of their eggs and their chicks. So the penguins are facing threats in both areas, in both realms. In the ocean, the main threats they face are climate change, marine pollution, and also fisheries mismanagement. And then when the penguins get on land, sorry, when the penguins get on land, they are threatened by human disturbance and the introduction of predators. I'm gonna talk about that later. Climate change is one of the main threats that are affecting species that live not only in Antarctica, but in other areas. In Antarctica, climate change is changing the pattern of ice formation and melting, and that is affecting the quality and also the availability of the habitat they need, not only to feed, but also to breathe. But climate change is also affecting penguins that live outside of Antarctica because what it does, it changes the distribution and the availability of the food. So the food is no longer closer to the colonies in the moment when it is needed, which is when the penguins are small. Because if the food is far away, the penguins cannot fly. So they cannot cover long distances quickly. They have to swim hundreds of kilometers, get the food, come back, and that takes a long, a long time. And when the chicks are small, they have to be fed every single day. So if it takes longer, by the time they come back, the chicks are dead, and that causes the decline of many populations. And also, climate change is increasing the severity and the frequency of very strong storms. And in my region, those storms take place in the moment when the chicks are small, so they're not waterproof enough. They're, the feathers are not ready to be wet, you know? So they get wet, like the picture that, of the chick that you can see here, they get cold. Normally, those storms come with very strong and, and cold winds, so they die because they lose their body temperature. Another threat are oil spills. Oil, oil spills have killed thousands of penguins in four continents already. And it was the main cause of the decline, one of the main causes of the decline of the African penguin, which collapsed from one million 
like 100 years ago, to only 21,000 pairs now. And fisheries is the third main threat in the ocean. Large-scale commercial fisheries, they have removed enormous numbers of fish from the oceans. And some uh, uh, species, prey species for penguins, are only a small fraction of what it, they used to be prior to fishing. So fisheries, they compete directly for the food with the penguins. And in some cases, the fisheries operate very close in front of the penguin colonies. And the other problem with the fisheries is that in some cases, penguins try to get food into the nets, so they get entangled and they die during the fishing operations. And the, the fisheries, in combination with climate change, produce the decline of the humble penguin in Peru and in Chile. And the population was 1.1 million in 1930, and now it's estimated in about 30,000 pairs. And then, as I was saying before, when penguins get on land, they are affected by human disturbance, but also by the introduction of predators. Because the penguins don't fly, and they could only evolve in a predator-free environment, mainly islands in the southern hemisphere. But when human be beings started to colonize those areas, we brought a lot of animals, like domestic dogs, cats, in some cases rats. And for example, I put a picture of possums in New Zealand. In New Zealand, there's a big issue with possums. There are 4 million people and 70 million possums. And they are eating all kinds of birds, including the chicks of the penguins. So for these reasons, in order to help the penguins, we created the Global Penguin Society nine years ago. And this is an organization, an international organization, that promotes the protection of all the species of penguins in the planet. So we are a small organization. Our budget is slightly above $250,000. And this graph shows you more or less how we allocate the funds. So as you can see, 27% goes to science, 36% goes to management, but this is management of protected areas. That implies identification, uh, design of management plans, implementation of protected areas, and also management plans of the colonies that are visited by tourists. 31% of our budget goes to education, and less than 6% goes to administration, because we are a very lean organization. We want most of our funds to go straight into the penguin conservation action. And in this other graph, I want to show you the geographic distribution of our funds. So as you can see, almost one third goes to global activities, and 23% goes to Argentina, then New Zealand, Chile, and then we have small percentage for countries like Peru, Ecuador, Australia, and Japan, because Japanese people, they love penguins. And for example, now they're going to traduce into Japanese the penguin book that maybe you've seen in our table uh, that we have downstairs. So to explain what is GPS and what we do, we created this uh, small promotional video in which quickly you can see what we do. Did you know that more than half of the species of penguins are considered threatened? They spend most of their lives swimming hundreds, even thousands of miles per year. They live in diverse habitats, from the cold ice of Antarctica and the South Pole, to desert tropical coasts on the Galapagos Islands. Some of them even breed in the dense forests of New Zealand. Penguins are excellent indicators of the health and conditions of the oceans. They're warning us in their own language that the oceans are in trouble. Climate change, pollution, and the mismanagement of fisheries have a negative impact on them. Global Penguin Society promotes the conservation of all 18 species of penguins through science, management, and education. It assesses the conservation status of populations through scientific studies, works with governments to create protected areas, and educates communities so people will value conservation and maintain a healthy marine and coastal environment. 
you can be a part of saving these incredible creatures and the oceans they live in by supporting Global Penguin Society. It's time to listen to the penguins and commit to their conservation and the protection of the world's oceans. Great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so now what I want to do is tell you stories about three different cases where we work. And the first one in the very southern extreme of South America. This is the place where we, we are currently working. This is, as you can see, this is the place where the Atlantic Ocean meets the Pacific Oceans, and the story takes place here. So the king penguins, they had colonies 150 years ago in that region, but they were slaughtered because penguins were boiled to make penguin oil, you know, together with sea lions and, and whales. So all the colonies were wiped out from the southern extreme of South America. But the good news is that they're coming back in this region. So 20 years ago, they started to come back, but there were some issues that they had to face. For example, here we see in this picture Luis. Luis is a warden that works for the Global Penguin Society. And in the picture, he's showing a box because when the penguins started to come back, local people were selling them for $200. They would put them in these boxes and some zodiacs would come and take the live penguins on fishing boats or big boats that they were sold illegally in Asia. So we started working with the landowners, trying to convince them about the need to, to do something to, to, to work for the conservation of penguins. So we helped them to develop a management plan and a sustainable low-scale touristic operation. So this is our team, the team that we work with, the GPS representatives in Chile. So you can see Luis, also Claudia. This is a colleague from Germany. We work together in scientific aspects, and Matthias, which is a volunteer. And one of the things that we do is we protect the penguins when they're on land, but we need to protect them when they're in the ocean. So we need to know where do they go when we don't see them. So we track the penguins, we put different kinds of devices, like the one you can see in the picture. And this is a penguin with a device on its back. And we are getting different kinds of information. This is the map of that area. I just selected the trips, foraging trips of three animals in different colors. But this is very valuable information because we know that there are plans to develop oil, uh, to make oil developments and also plans to develop new kinds of fisheries in the area. So in this case, if we know where they overlap with these developments, we can help to secure uh, the, these areas to create marine protected areas to work with the fisheries to improve the management of those activities. So when the penguins come on land, they're also facing threats. So one of the issues that we were facing is that there were introduced foxes that were, they were eating the, the chicks of the penguins. So from one of the ranches, we brought these two guys, these two dogs, they are trained to protect the sheep from pumas and from foxes. So we used these, these dogs to protect the penguin chicks during the nights when we couldn't protect them. And they were very, very effective. And we don't only work in, in science and also in management, but we also have a very strong educational program. So we work with the communities and the kids. We take them for the first time to visit their penguins because we want to develop a sense of ownership. In most of the cases, these kids for the, from the small towns, they're going to stay in those towns. They're going to be, become the decision makers and decide about the future of those penguins. So the good news is that the colony has been growing, and right now it stays, the, you can see penguins all year long, and the, the population size is about 153 adults right now. So the second story, and now we move from southern Chile to the other extreme of, in New Zealand, this is a story about the Fjordland crested penguins. You know, all the penguins in New Zealand are considered sacred. They are sacred animals by the Maori communities, and this is called the Tawaki project, uh, sorry, the Tawaki penguin, which is the local name. These are our GPS representatives, Ursula and Thomas. Mm, they work with us in science and also in our relationship with the government, the Department of uh, Education, of Conservation. 
And of course, we also do many things. We track these animals, many different things. But one of the things, again, is we put the devices, as you can see here in the back, to know where do the penguins go. And this species, the Fjordland, the Tawaki, was the least studied species of all. We knew almost nothing about them. And one of the issues, one of the things that we didn't know is that when they end the, end the breeding season they, and they fledge their chicks, they disappear. So we didn't know where they were. So we tracked these animals, and this is what we found. Isn't it fantastic? <laughs> 6,000 kilometers, halfway to Antarctica. So now we know where they are going, and we are going to study if they overlap with traffic, mar maritime traffic, or other developments. Hmm? So the great thing is that the government of New Zealand is using this information because they are going now into a process to design a network of marine protected areas, and we are contributing in that process. And the third story, and the last one, is about the Magellanic penguins. This is in Argentina. And out of many different stories, I selected one that I consider that is very special. Ten years ago, we discovered a brand new colony with only six pairs of penguins. The place was a mess. It was covered by garbage. There were reckless fishermen, people that didn't care about the penguins. There was pieces of cars everywhere. They would set bushes on fire to make barbecues. They would come with dogs that were harming the penguins. So we knew we needed to do something. So first of all, one of the problems was that the, there was so much garbage that penguins get entangled in the garbage. So you can see this picture of a penguin with a plastic bag around his neck. And it was very common to find you know, penguins with plastic bags you know, that they couldn't breathe. So that was an issue that we had to solve. So first of all, there was no legal tool to protect them immediately mm, to secure the habitat. So we decided to close the gate, you know? And so we, we decided to, to close the gate by, uh, by ourselves. And we had many problems, you know? People came and they put glue in the locker so we couldn't go into the colonies. They would cut the iron fences. They would come with guns, so that was kind of dangerous. But we decided to go for that. So we work with the local stakeholders, with the landowners as well, and then with the government later, and we were able to designate this as a wildlife refuge. This is the team that works with us in Argentina. I see three students, and Luján and Laura that you're going to meet later today. And as I told you, one of the big issues was the, was the garbage. So we started organizing a campaign that is called Cleaning the House of the Penguins. So we take adolescents, almost 100 adolescents for, from the nearest communities, and we collect all the garbage from all the bay in front of the colony. Do you see these pieces? This is all 
big plastic boxes from the fisheries. And there's plastics all over the place. So this is the picture before the campaign, and this is the picture after the campaign. And we do this, thank you. <laughs> We do this before they come from migration, so they have a safe and clean place to, to breathe. And the great news is that we also work with the landowners, and now there is a very low-scale, responsible touristic operation, and that has generated new 10 jobs for local people and generates a lot of revenues for the local economies. So now everybody wants the, the penguins to stay. Hmm? And the best news is that the colony grew from six pairs in 2008, and now the colony has got 1,800 pairs, and it will continue to grow. So that's, that's a great conservation story. And as Claire mentioned before, one of the great accomplishments that we did, thanks to the support of Disney, was that we were able to create the largest UNESCO biosphere reserve in Argentina called Patagonia Azul, or Blue Patagonia. This is the area that covers, and it has a surface of over 8 million acres, which is roughly the size of Maryland. And as Claire also mentioned, it includes 20 penguin colonies, which is 40% of the global population of, of Magellanic penguins. And also it includes the uh, 65 species of seabirds, the complete population of a flightless endemic bird, duck that only lives there, some uh, terrestrial birds that live in the area, 35 mammals, like this uh, Patagonian hare, pumas, for example, and 37 species of, of marine mammals like the southern right whale and different species of dolphins. So this is a clear example of how we can also use penguins to protect many big environments and many other species that maybe we don't know enough about or maybe they're not so visible as penguins. And the other thing that we were able to do is we were able to create the marine protected area for one of the largest Magellanic penguin colonies in the world. So with the information from many colleagues, we were able to work together with the government. And finally, the government approved the, the creation of this colony that will secure the food for the penguins when the chicks are small. And in education, we have a very strong educational program, and we produce different kinds of material, like the poster that maybe you've seen in our table with all the penguin species in the planet, their population sizes, and different kinds of material like Mensajeros del Mar, which is in Spanish, and we distribute it for free for all the countries that have penguins and speak Spanish. And as I mentioned before, in Argentina, in uh, Chile, we did it also uh, as a pilot uh, uh, program in South Africa, and now we want to expand to Chile and, and, and Ecuador. We are taking the kids, and so far we have taken 6,000 6, kids to visit their penguins for the first time. But one of the problems that we saw is that the impact on the kids depending, depended on the motivation of the teachers. So we made an agreement with the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Environment. So now we offer a course for the teachers, which is an official course. So the teachers get prepared and take advantage of the trips that we afford and we offer to the schools. And now, more globally, we also operate at, at, at a different scale. And we were able to be part of a big initiative um, that was trying to include the protection of the oceans within the United Nations agenda, because the oceans were never included into the agenda. So we went to the headquarters in, in, in New York, and we talked in front of the presidents and you know, ambassadors, and that was really, really a great, uh, a, a great um, challenge and effort. But finally, 193 countries signed up, and the, the, the protection of the ocean was included as a sustainable development goal. So now the, all, the, all the countries are committed to increase the protection of their, uh, of their oceans. And thank you. That was a huge effort from many, many big international organizations. And that was promoted by the president of Palau, which is a very small country. And the president decided to protect 
and de declare all his jurisdictional waters as, as protected area. And as you could see in the film, the penguins, they swim so much that they cross borders of many countries. So we knew there was a need to work more internationally. So together with my colleague, Di Borsma, we founded and created the, the Penguin Specialist Group that belongs to IUCN. And these groups are, represent like a high level of scientific rigor and credibility and has a very big impact on international and national policy. So this is going to be very effective for international penguin conservation. And as Claire mentioned, this was a surprise because we didn't apply for this. <laughs> it came on, a, on an email, but the good news is that we received in April the Whitley Gold Award, which is presented by Princess Anne uh, of England. She's the, the daughter of the Queen. And the, 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 the great thing about this is that it recognizes the value of the things that Global Penguin Society does, that they have an international value. This is, no world, uh, it is known as the Green Oscar this award because it is very important in the, in the environmental arena. And the, 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 other, the other surprise is that this year, the organization Whitley Fund for Nature celebrated 25 years. So out of all the winners that received the traditional award, they selected the gold. And we were surprised that we were so lucky to receive it. But the fantastic things is not the award, it's the possibility to increase the visibility of the things that are important for us, the penguins and the oceans. So it opens us a lot of opportunities to talk to people that have a lot of influence in the world. So there were several moments in which we could talk to, to Princess Anne. And one of the things I was telling her is that we did a jurisdictional analysis and we discovered that most, the country with the most numbers of penguin species under its jurisdiction is the United Kingdom due to their overseas territories. So I was just telling her that that is a great honor for the United Kingdom, but at the same time, a great responsibility. And I, I really ask her to continue talking about penguins and the ocean. She loves penguins, by the way. <laughs> and the other, the other thing that also Claire mentioned is that we receive, I don't know, it's the year of the penguin. <laughs> So we, we also received the National Geographic uh, Award for Leadership in Conservation. One award goes to Africa for our colleague and fantastic conservationist Leonidas, and the other one goes to, 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 to Latin America. And again, the great thing is to be surrounded by people that have, has a very big influence, like the former president of Chile that also declared a lot of marine protected areas in, in, in Chile, a minister of international uh, relationships of Argentina, and maybe you know Jane Lubchenco. She was the former head of NOAA during the Obama administration here. So these are the great things about the awards because they give us credibility and they allow us to open political doors and people pay more attention to the things that we have been saying for 30 years. <laughs> so what I want to show you now is the, the, uh, the, um, the video that Whitley uh, prepared for the, for the award because theoretically it was a secret. Nobody knew uh, until it was uh, announced during the, the ceremony. So this is the video that they prepared to announce the award. Penguin, one of the most perfectly adapted birds on the planet. Social, graceful, and elegant. I don't know if I pick them or they pick me. I don't know exactly how it <laughs> Even in perfect conditions, penguins could do with a little help. The first time I visited a penguin colony and I was surrounded by almost half a million penguins, I knew that protecting penguins was the mission of my life. 2010 Whitley Award winner Pablo Boboroglu was inspired to set up the Global Penguin Society in response to extreme pressures facing them. A penguin is important 
uh, in my view, because they are excellent indicators of the health of the ocean. Pablo saw that most penguins are facing similar threats. On land, habitat loss, introduced predators, and nest disturbance are reducing their breeding success. In the water, a lack of food due to overfishing and climate change combined with an increase in marine pollution is causing colonies to shrink. Pablo has devised solutions to tackle all of these problems head on. We work on science, on management and on education. Those are the three components that are key for success. What we do is we gather the information that is needed to, to guide conservation action, but also empower the communities so they are aware of what's going on, because the communities have been very useful to convince politicians about the need to do something. Impressively, this has helped Pablo spearhead the conservation of over three million hectares of marine and coastal areas including creation of the largest UNESCO biosphere reserve in Argentina. A huge awareness program has encouraged people to champion these flightless birds, whilst over 6,000 children have joined educational trips to penguin colonies. Pablo's successful work has not gone unnoticed. Interviews with global media stations have helped raise the profile of the threats facing marine wildlife and even got oceans onto the UN political agenda. Pablo's Whitley Gold Award will be used to further protect threatened penguin colonies across the world with the development of a global penguin conservation agenda. Research will inform large-scale action, protected area designation and fisheries management, balancing local guardianship with national and international protection. People that work in conservation, we ask ourselves, why do we do this? Sometimes we take risks, sometimes we, we are threatened. The only way to, to, to be healthy is to, to be connected to wildlife. We work to protect wildlife and to protect the environment because that's the key for, for, for happy people. So we benefit penguins, we benefit the oceans, but we also benefit people. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So all of this is only possible when you work with fantastic people and when you have a great team of people working with you. So today I have the pleasure to introduce two of our key members of the Global Penguin Society, Laura and Luhan, and they are going to explain us what is their role within the Global Penguin Society. Hello, everybody. How are you? <laughs> I'm Laura, and that's my first expo. This is my first expo. So I'm really happy. I'm really excited to be here. This is a very fantastic moment for us. And I'm that one in the family pictures, because I'm Poppy's wife. <laughs> Yes, and, but also I am a marine biologist and my role in GPS is to try to identify the best way to protect the, the habitat for the penguins. So with our team we work identifying the main areas to be protected and then we prepare the proposals for the government. We help the government to plan the area. And uh, finally, we help them to implement that area, this area. 
Um, it's a lot of work, mainly with uh, the stakeholders and the government, and including the fishermen. By, but also I love, I really love teaching, so, because I am a professor at the university. So sometimes I help my friend and colleague, Luhan, with her activities. And also I help Poppy, or Pablo, well, Poppy, he's Poppy. <laughs> I'm Poppy, really, I yes. <laughs> it's or, official. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I help with the um, work on the field, with the field work. Sensors in penguins, and in my free times, I cut skulls. <laughs> <laughs> I collect skulls. <laughs> well, Thank I you. present you, I will introduce Luhan. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, thanks, Laura. Um, I am a biologist. I manage the educational program of Global Penguin Society in Argentina. Our main activity is to give talks at the schools to the children, teachers, and teenagers about the penguins' life and the conservation problem that they have in their habitat. Then we take them to the penguin colony. Um, in some cases, it is the first time that they have seen a penguin and the ocean. It is a really lovely moment for them. Uh, we too do other activities like talks to the communities, developing educational material, and getting around our activities in the media. So um, our aim is to raise awareness and generate conservation values uh, to, get it, to taking care about the penguins and the ocean. So I am very happy to be here because too, like Laura, it is the first time that I have come to this event. Um, thanks, Poppy and Laura, hmm. for teaching me the passion, the commitment, and the values behind our work. Yes, uh, thank you to everybody. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> so before I finished, I want to share with you a message. You know, I have an ask. And I'm going to use the Im images of the National Geographic campaign, Planet or Plastics. You know, we live in a plastic culture. We are addicted to plastics. For a long time, we fell in love with, with plastics without thinking about the consequences. And now it is a big issue. Every single year, nine million tons of plat plastics, they end up in the ocean where it can be lethal to many animals. So far, at least 700 species, marine species, have been reported to be affected by by, by different kinds of plastics. Only 20% of the plastics that are produced are recycled. So we need to stop using them or reduce the use in the first place. So everyone here, every single one of us can play a part making a small changes in our daily lives. So I ask you to please consider avoiding single-use plastics. And to finish, I want to tell that, as you have seen in this presentation, the Global Penguin Society is an international challenge that demands a lot of effort and also a lot of resources. We have been able to benefit 1.2 million penguins in four continents, and that has only been possible thanks to you because if it wasn't for your support, most of those penguins would be dead by now, or they, were, they would be really having a hard life. So today, what I want to say to finish this uh, presentation is that we share a common interest, because we work and we live to ensure a future, not only for the penguins, but also for the people and our entire planet. So thank you so much.